really excited to have Jim Brickman here. He is the co-founder of Atomic Squirrel. Um, he was recently, or before him, he was uh, at LinkedIn TripAdvisor in Cisco. Um, and he also recently wrote and published the book Hello Startup. So here he is. using the chorus are the same? That's right. All of those songs use the exact same four chords. And it's not just them, actually. There are dozens and dozens, probably some of your favorite hit songs from the last 50 years, are all based on the exact same four chords. And you guys got to remind me of this. At the end of the talk, if we have time, I'm going to show you this video. Uh, who, who's seen this video before? All right, a few people have seen it. Most of you have not. So we should definitely watch this at the end of the talk. This is an amazing song. 
song, and if you don't believe me that all those songs are based on, on four chords, these guys will convince me. So we'll come back to that. Um, another interesting fact. I don't know if you guys can see that from where you are, but that's a list of the top 100 movies <clears throat> based on revenue from 2000 to 2009. And there's movies in there like Shrek 2 and Star Wars Episode 3 and Lord of the Rings Return of the King. And the reason I bring them up is that 74 of those top 100 movies were sequels, remakes, or adaptations. The movies that we love are not particularly original. Uh, the really fun one is actually number six on the list, Transformers of the Fall. The reason that this one is fun is this paragon of originality is a sequel to a movie based on a cartoon, based on a US line of toys, based on a Japanese line of toys. Another example is operating systems. So this is Microsoft Windows from the 90s which is a little bit similar to Apple's Mac OS from 1984, which copied all of its ideas from the Xerox Alto in 730, which copied all of its ideas from the Stanford NLS computer from 1968. Uh, the screenshot's a little blurry, but have you guys seen the mother of all demos? Has anyone heard of the mother of all demos? Okay, add that to your to watch list. The mother of all demos, it's 1968. It's a guy named Douglas Engelbart. And he sits down, and just to set the context, 1968, most computers of, of the era are metal boxes with lights and switches. Monitors and mice and tablets, these things are just figments of people's imagination. And so in 1968, Douglas Engelbart sits down and shows a demo that basically describes everything computing will do for the next 40 years. He shows a demo of a graphical user interface, with word processing, of spreadsheet editing, of image editing, video conferencing. I was on Skype the other day. His demo was better than Skype is today. Um, check out the demo. It's about an hour long, so skip around a little bit. But it's it's just mind-boggling how many of those ideas were around in 68. So the reason I bring all of these things up is, and a lot of this comes from this wonderful video called Everything's Remix by Kirby Ferguson, <clears throat> is that most of the things that we think of as these original, brilliant, new ideas and creations are really just a remix. And I don't say that in a bad way. This is not an insult. This is not about plagiarism or anything like that. It's actually just the way creativity happens. If you really want to think about how to come up with ideas, you shouldn't be imagining new things popping out of nowhere. You should be thinking of remix of things that you already have in your mind. Um, and this is exactly how most startups work, right? Uh, Google, which I mentioned earlier in the talk, it wasn't the first search engine. There were 10 search engines at least before it, such as Yahoo and Alphabisa. And their main idea was copied from the field of bibliometrics and citation analysis, which have been around since at least the 60s. Uh, LinkedIn wasn't the first social network. Six Degrees and Friendster came before it. LinkedIn wasn't the first professional network. Rise and Zing came before it. It wasn't the first online job board. Monster and Hot Jobs beat it. It wasn't even Reed Hoffman's first attempt at a social network. How many of you guys have heard of social net? Yeah, exactly. That was Reed Hoffman's first attempt at a social network. Um, this talk is just a remix of my book. My, my book is just a remix of other books. There's 500 references in the back of the book. And that's really the point is what creativity really consists of is these three elements. This is from that Everything's Remix video. It's copy, transform, and combine. This is how ideas happen. This is how creativity happens. These are not bad things. These are not something to avoid. This is what you need to do. So copying is how everybody learns, right? A child copies uh, the mom. Uh, when an artist is starting out, they copy the masters. When a programmer is learning to code, they copy and paste. That's what it is. Copying is a huge part of creativity. Transform is when you take something that exists, you copy it, and then you tweak it a bit. That's like Thomas Edison and the light bulb. He took light bulbs, which had been around, and he improved the film. And then combine is where you take a bunch of ideas that exist, and you combine them in some new way. So Gutenberg invented the printing press, but he didn't invent the screw press, or the little type, or paper, or ink, or any of the other technologies. He just combined them together to make it all work. So this is what you want to think of with creativity. Another way to think about it is, if this is the knowledge that's in your head, these are the things that you know, 
than ideas or the connections between those pieces of knowledge. Ideas are not something new. They're not something that come out of nowhere. There's like, think of like the conservation laws in physics, right? Conservation of mass, conservation of energy. You don't create energy out of nowhere. You just repurpose energy that's already there. And that's how ideas work. You repurpose the knowledge that is in your head, you copy, transform, and combine to come up with new ideas. Which means that, of course, one of the most important things to come up with ideas is having a lot of knowledge. Uh, you gotta read a lot. You gotta get really deep into whatever topic you're interested in. You gotta learn as much as you can because it's not a linear relationship, right? The number of connections grows as a square of the number of things you learn. So the more you know, the much more you'll be able to come up with ideas. But the other thing you need for connections to actually form is the right environment. So if you look out, if you look through history, you'll find that there's a bunch of cases of what's known as a multiple discovery. This is when a couple inventors come up with pretty much the same idea at, at the same time, but they do it independently. So some examples of this are capitalists. Uh, Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, um, they both came up with capitalists at more or less the same time, and spent a lot of time fighting over who should get credit. Uh, evolution. Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace came up with these ideas that independently at roughly the same time. And the telephone. <clears throat> Elijah Gray and Alexander Graham Bell, they find uh, patents on the same day for the telephone, the exact same day. So the reason I bring this up, this is a little bit of a long quote from Henry Ford, but I think it really captures uh, a lot of the ideas around how important the environment is. Uh, what Henry Ford said is that I invented nothing new. I simply assembled the discoveries of other men behind him for centuries of work. Had I worked 50 or 10 or even five years before, I would have failed. So it is with every new thing. Progress happens when all the factors that make for it are ready, and then it is inevitable. To teach that a comparatively few men are responsible for the greatest forward steps of mankind is the worst kind of nonsense. I think it's a really powerful quote for a few reasons, but I think the thing to note here is that Progress happens when the factors that make for it are ready, and then it is inevitable. What that really says is if you create the right environment, you will have the ideas you're looking for. You can't force them, you don't have full control over it, but you can create an environment to, to encourage it. And so, here's a few ingredients that I've found from personal experience from research that really help come up with new ideas. So we'll go through these. The first one is to keep an idea journal. <clears throat> the idea behind an idea journal is it's not a diary. A diary you write in it once a day and complain about whatever happened. Uh, idea journal is something you carry around. It can be a notebook, it can be your phone, it can be whatever, just somewhere you can write. And anytime you have an idea, you jot it down. Any idea whatsoever. And probably the most important thing about an idea journal is to not filter yourself. Don't judge those ideas. Don't think, ah, this is probably stupid. I shouldn't write it down. Write it down anyway. In fact, write down not just ideas, but also problems and questions. If you come across something you don't know why it, that it works that way or how to solve it, write it down as well. Why this is so important is actually based on a lot of research. So there was a UC Davis study <clears throat> where they looked at eminent, eminent scientists and mathematicians and all sorts of other eminent achievers throughout history. And they found that these folks did produce more great works than other folks, but they also produced way more bad ones. So what really made eminent achievers creative was not doing higher quality work on average. Their average was actually more or less the same. It was just doing more work. To have good ideas, you have to have a lot of really bad ideas. So that's why you can't filter yourself. You can't judge, because if you do, then you're not going to have any. Uh, another way to phrase this is the best way to have a good idea is to have a lot of ideas. And the other thing to do with your idea journal is just to review it periodically. Just once every couple of months, sit down and just flip through it. And it's really fun to see what's in there. Some of the ideas will look really stupid, that's okay. Some will look kind of interesting, and some you will realize look really different. Because you've learned something new, you have some new connection, and all of a sudden that thing that initially didn't seem very important is. And this is basically how ideas, you plant the seeds by writing them down, and then you, by periodically reviewing them, you learn new things, this is how they grow, this is how they evolve. And pretty much every 
great thinker of the last uh, thousand years has kept an idea journal. Everyone from Einstein to Mary Curie is known for keeping these things around. So it's, it's a good practice. I personally use Google Docs, but do whatever is easiest for you. Um, other key ingredients, getting away from work. So you do have to focus really intensely on your work and load this problem into your mind. But you should also make sure to schedule regular time to get away from work. Uh, there's a lot of research around this. It's a concept called functional fixedness, which means you're focused on one particular way of thinking about the problem. And the only way to be creative to come up with better ideas is actually to get away from the problem and kind of break that cycle. And there's lots of different ways of doing this. Uh, Einstein was known for doing a lot of his best thinking during viable breaks. A lot of you probably get your best ideas from the shower. Uh, I get mine when I go on walks. If you ever see me out on a walk, I'm usually walking like this, furiously scribbling down random ideas that are starting to pop into my head. Um, there's a bunch of research around that too. Walking actually increases creativity. Another interesting technique that really helps come up with ideas is to add constraints. Which sounds a little counterintuitive, right? Why would constraining things somehow help you get more ideas? So let's try a really quick exercise. Uh, it's from the book, Made to Stick. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to 15. And while I'm doing that, I want you guys, in your head, to think of all the things in the world that are colored white. All the white colored things you can think of in your head. Ready? Go. Which one do you guys think was easier? Who found it easier to think of white things in your refrigerator? Okay. And why would that be, right? The vast majority of white things in the world are obviously not in your refrigerator. It's a tiny subset of the universe. But it's much, much easier to think of those things. And the reason is that constraints actually really help creativity. And I think the reason for this, I don't think we know exactly, but it's just that the mind is kind of limited. There's only so much stuff you can fit in it at a time. And so if you're trying to think of really broad topics, then you're trying to cram every single thing you know in your head, and it's kind of like trying to juggle 100 different balls, and they just kind of all fall to the ground. When you add constraints, you focus in on a small number of topics that can fit in your head, and then it's much easier to come up with ideas very quickly from them. Um, another classic example of this is from Ernest Hemingway. Uh, somebody challenged him to write a story and that total length of that story had to be six words. It's a pretty extreme constraint, right? How the heck can you write any meaningful anything in six words? If you can. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. So if you're struggling to come up with an idea, and then literally if you're sitting there and there's nothing good is coming to mind, one of the most useful things you can do is to try to constrain the problem, narrow the problem space. Sometimes you can do this by just very quickly eliminating all sorts of possibilities and saying, okay, this is impossible and this won't help, and just get rid of them and try to focus on a small part. Sometimes you can add arbitrary constraints, like write a story in six words. It doesn't matter too much. It's just an exercise to get your creativity going a little bit. Another way to approach uh, coming up with ideas is to live in the future. This is a quote from Paul Graham, where he says to live in the future and then build what's missing. It's a pretty powerful concept, but I always struggle to come up with exactly how, how do you live in the future? How do you actually get your mind to, to do something like that? And one of the ways to achieve that is, uh, I, saw the, I saw in a talk from Alan Kay, where he talks about a Xerox part where they used to play the Wayne Gretzky game. Well, they named it that later on. So Wayne Gretzky, for those of you who don't know, is considered the greatest hockey player of all time. He has the record for the most goals, the most assists, the most points. He has the record for the most records. Like, this guy is the best player ever. And when people asked him what made him so successful, he said that 
what he tries to do is to skate to where the puck is going to be rather than where it was. And so that's kind of the basis of this Wayne Gretzky game. This is a, a screen capture from Alan Kay's talk. And the idea here is you put the puck way out there. You try to go to where the puck is going. So what you do is you pick some sort of a really long timer, like 30 years from now. And you basically say a sentence like this. Wouldn't it be ridiculous if in 30 years we didn't have an enemy fill in the blank? So when Alan Kay did this in the early 70s, he said, wouldn't it be ridiculous if every human being didn't have a laptop or a tablet. And that seems obvious to us today, but in the early 70s, we had computers were basically metal boxes with lights and switches, so they didn't appear. So the idea that you had a little portable touchscreen device is kind of mind blowing. But to him, it would just seem ridiculous if in a future 30 years from now, we didn't have that. And the cool thing about thinking that far out, going where the puck is going to be, is you don't have to worry about how. You don't have to limit yourself based on the technologies or the abilities we have today. You can just kind of go freely come up with whatever ideas come to mind 30 years from now, 40 years from now. It gets your creativity going, and then once you stumble on something, right, you imagine this Star Trek universe out in the future, and you're like, well, of course they're going to have this. Then you can work backwards and uh, find some realistic way to actually build something like that. Uh, next technique is looking for pain. So I'm a firm believer that anytime there is pain, there is opportunity. So uh, there was this great talk by, I'm going to butcher his name, apologies, Ma Mahmoud Abuzi, where he says, anytime you hear yourself saying the sentence, this is stupid, there must be a better way, write it down. Because that's an opportunity. That's almost certainly a business opportunity. I remember the other day doing a bank transfer online. I'm clicking around a UI, and I click transfer some money to somebody else. And all that needs to happen is a few bits need to flip in a server somewhere else. It can't take more than milliseconds, but that bank transfer takes a week. And all I can think to myself is, this is stupid. There's, there's got to be a better way to do a bank transfer. What the hell does this take a week? And that's a business opportunity, right? That's where things like Bitcoin and these kind of disruptive technologies, that's where they come from. This is stupid. It shouldn't take a week. So pay attention. Anytime you see pain, that's anytime you see somebody upset, anytime you see yourself upset, that's almost certainly an idea that's just waiting for you to discover it. Another way to look at it comes from Reid Hoffman, uh, who's fond of saying, is this how the world should be? Uh, an example of this, uh, the reason there's a blueprint in the background, is a lot of construction companies, even in the modern era, are still using paper blueprints. They're like rolling them out, and like spilling coffee on them, they're losing them. And a company called Landgrid thought that's not really the way the world should be. And they came up with software that lets you manage blueprints on your computer, bring them on site on a tablet, see them on a phone. And it just comes from asking, is this the way the world should be? Should in 2016 we still be using giant paper blueprints? And then the final technique is talking about it. And the first thing to say about that is you probably shouldn't keep your ideas secret. A lot of people are very secretive and protective of all the ideas that they have. And it's kind of counterproductive. I mean, first of all, I'm going to be honest with you, no one's going to steal your ideas. They're just not. Try it. Like, it's actually impossible to convince people of any idea that's actually even meaningful, that's meaningful and interesting. So, no one's going to steal your ideas. But even if they do, all that means is that idea wasn't defensible. Right? If somebody can just overhear you and from that completely destroy your business, you didn't have a business. You would have lost anyway. It's not a defensible idea. And a classical example of this is, I have an idea for a photo sharing app. Yeah, OK, that's, that, that's not defensible. Clearly, somebody can steal that and beat you. But how about, I have an idea for a low-cost way to launch things into orbit. Do they even need me just by, just by hearing me say that? No. So don't worry about people stealing your ideas. It's extremely, extremely unlikely. But you get benefits from sharing them. So there's a bunch of research around this as well, where it turns out that talking to other people is a really powerful tool for creativity. They did a study where they followed around, I forget if it was chemists or I think it was a bunch of chemists at a lab. And anytime that chemist had a breakthrough or some kind of an idea or just came up with something new, 
they wrote down where the chemist was at the time that they had the idea. And what they found was that most of the ideas didn't happen at their desk. They didn't happen behind a microscope. They happened in the conference room. They happened when they were sitting around talking to their, to their colleagues, trying to just discuss and figure out what the problem was, and then all of a sudden, they have some sort of breakthrough. And what's interesting is that just explaining your ideas out loud can be enough to give you new ideas. Part of this is that when you have an idea in your head, it's kind of, it's not fully formed. It's only when you write it down in an idea journal. When you speak it to somebody else, then you actually turn it into something concrete. And what you find is that it doesn't even matter who the other person is in some cases. Um, even if they don't really understand a lot about what you're talking about, it's still helpful to do this. Um, I'm a programmer. Uh, my girlfriend's a historian. We often go on walks together and talk about ideas and problems and things like that. And neither of us knows that much about the other person's discipline. And what we find is that to explain what we're thinking about, we have to use all sorts of analogies and metaphors. And just the act of coming up with an analogy and simplifying some concept, all of a sudden you understand it better. All of a sudden you get a new idea. So talk to people as often as you can. In fact, it doesn't even matter if the other person's a person. So there's a technique, if you guys are programmers, called rubber duck debugging. And so here's the idea. You keep a little rubber ducky next to your computer. And if you come across some problem where you've just been thinking about it for hours and you just can't solve it, you can't figure it out, what you do is you pick up your little rubber ducky and you very clearly and very slowly explain the problem to them. And by the time you're done explaining the problem to the rubber duck, you usually know the solution. So talk to other people. Okay, so hopefully that's a helpful overview of some of the tools and techniques for coming up with ideas. Um, now the question is how do you know that these ideas are actually any good? And this is actually a really important question. Uh, ooh, that text got cut off a little bit. Uh, so if you read this book, The Four Steps to the Epiphany, you'll find out that whether you're a startup or a giant company, nine out of ten times when you launch a new product, it's going to fail. And CB Insights uh, looked at postmortems from 100 failed startups. Actually, more than 100. And they found that the number one cause of startup failure was no market need. Almost half of these startups we're sitting in a room for months or years building something that nobody out there actually wanted. They were solving the wrong problem. And the, the reason for this is it's really easy to come up with ideas or find problems that sound like real problems. They seem like legitimate, something important to solve, but they're not really what people care about. So here's an example from the dental industry. I'm not actually an expert on the dental industry, but it works as an analogy. Uh, so my impression from looking at their ads and products and things like that is the problems that they thought they needed to solve were healthy teeth and healthy gums. And so they built products and marketing all around healthy teeth and healthy gums. And you ended up with products that looked like that. And then some marketing genius came along and realized that the problem customers actually care about are not healthy teeth and healthy gums, but white teeth and fresh breath. Subtle difference, but the result is an explosion of all sorts of crazy products and breath mints and whitening strips and 3D whitening toothpaste and whatever the hell that stuff is. And it's all about just figuring out what is the actual problem that people care about. Because if you're solving the wrong problem, even if it sounds similar, but if you're solving the wrong problem, you're not going to build the right product, you're not going to have the right marketing strategy, you're not going to have the right sales strategy. You really have to get down to the right problem to be successful. And as we saw from the, the, the postmortems, most startups fail at exactly that. Uh, another way to put this is people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill. They want a quarter inch hole. Actually, what they really want to extend this is they want to hang on painting. And so if all of your products and marketing and sales are about drills and torque and things like that, you're probably not going to solve any drills. But if you're focused on how to help people hang up paintings, then you'll do well. So how do you find out that the problem you're looking at is actually the right problem? It's pretty hard, uh, but there's a few techniques that tend to be pretty helpful. So we'll look at the first one, which is to ask who will buy it. Really what you want to do when you come up with an idea or you find
why we have a problem is you want to find a customer before you build the product. In fact, you want a customer who will commit to buying or even give you money before you build the product, which is a little counterintuitive, right? Who, what customer is going to give you money before you have a product? And the answer to this is what Steve Blank calls an early evangelist. Um, kind of an odd word, but early evangelist is basically this. It's somebody who has a problem. They know they have a problem. And my favorite sign is they've built an interim solution. It's something so painful that they're willing to put in all sorts of workarounds and hacks and try to find some way to solve it, but it's just not great. And there's some money to spend. That's who you're looking for. And ideally, you, you don't want to build something until you have a whole bunch of these folks banging down your door, begging you for this thing. That's how you know you've found a real problem, where you go up to people and you say, hey, if I build this, would you buy it? And they say, yes, please bring that to me. I need it now. That's what you're looking for. And that's hard, but that's, that's how you know you're going to you found a problem that's actually worth solving. And the only way to do that is to get out of the building. You're not going to find them sitting on your laptop. You're not going to find them sitting, you know, taking a shower, coming up with ideas. You have to get out of the building, and you have to talk to those customers, and you have to find out what do they actually care about. Is this the problem that you should be solving? Now, there's a little bit of a catch here, and probably the best way to explain it is based on a uh, talk by Malcolm Gladwell called Choice Happiness in Spaghetti Sauce. And something that he talks about is if you go up to people and you ask them a question, what, what kind of coffee do you like? Most people are going to tell you something along the lines of, I like a dark, rich, hearty roast. That's kind of the classic answer, right? Dark, rich, hearty roast. They're obsessed with coffee. Except if you actually do blind taste tests, what you find out is people actually like milky, weak coffee. <laughs> so the problem is, you want to find out what the problem is. You want to talk to those customers. But it's actually tricky because they won't always give you the answers that are actually helpful. Sometimes because they don't know. Sometimes because they don't want to tell you, right? They might not tell you how much they're willing to pay because uh, it's not really to their advantage to do so. Uh, so you have to be really, really careful. Um, another way, by the way, to phrase this, again, Henry Ford has always says it better than I can. Um, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, right? So you have to, what you really have to do is you have to dig. You have to try to get to the underlying cause, not just the first thing the potential customer says, not the features they tell you to build, but to find what is the underlying problem. This is hard. It takes a lot of practice. Um, one technique that can help is called the five wise technique. And it comes from uh, Toyota. And they use this to get to, to do essentially what's called root cause analysis. So the best way to explain the five whys is just to give you an example. Um, imagine you own some sort of trucking company. And Bob comes along, one of your employees, and tells you that the truck won't start. So one option you have, of course, is just to tell Bob to replace the truck, and you're done. You solve the problem. But if you try the five whys technique, you might be able to get down to the root cause. So what you do is you basically just keep asking him why. That doesn't have to be exactly five times, but you know, enough to get down to the root cause. So if you ask Bob, well, what, why doesn't the truck start? He might tell you, ooh, those quotes got messed up. Anyway, he might tell you the battery guy. Okay, well, you could replace the battery and be done with it, but ask why one more time. So why did that happen? Because the alternator wasn't working. Okay, well, why wasn't the alternator working? Because the alternator belt broke. Why did the alternator belt break? Because it wasn't replaced on time. Why wasn't the alternator belt replaced on time? Because we didn't follow the proper maintenance schedule. So by asking why, you get down to the actual root cause. If you just replaced that truck when you first heard the problem, you would have solved the problem for now, but then every other truck in your fleet would have been broken eventually too. Using five whys allows you to find out what the real problem is and fix the real problem, the one that customers will actually care about. Okay, there's a couple more whys that are worth asking whenever you're trying to validate a problem. One of the most important ones is why now? This is a question from Sequoia Capital, most successful VC firms in the world. And they like to ask people, uh, startup founders, why now? Why is now the time to build your startup? Why not two years ago? Why not wait and do it two years from now? What has changed that makes now the right time for your idea? And 
An example of how to think about something like this uh, comes from uh, grocery delivery, online grocery delivery. So in the late 90s, there was a company called Webvan, which some of you may have heard of, which set out to do online grocery delivery. And they raised something like $800 million to do it. And they spent it buying a giant fleet of trucks and buying warehouses and building a huge software team to manage this gigantic inventory of groceries. And then probably went out of business, taking $800 million with them. So nowadays, a whole bunch of these grocery delivery companies are popping up again, things like Instacart. And then a good question is, why not? Why should Instacart work now, whereas Webvan failed miserably in the past? And so I can think of at least two answers for why it might work. I mean, who knows? Time will tell. But one answer is simply that there's a lot more people online today, and there are a lot more used to buying things online. And then the second one is the mobile phone. Instacart can do grocery delivery without buying a fleet of trucks and without having a giant inventory of food in their warehouses because all of their drivers just use their own cars and they go shopping at local supermarkets. So the mobile phone, the ubiquity of it is there, why now? So if you come across a problem, you should also ask, why not? Why hasn't anyone solved this before? Why is now the time to do it? What changed? One more question to really think about, especially if you're thinking of founding a startup or taking on any large project, is why you should be the one to do it. Uh, even if you found a real problem, even if you're sure it's going to be successful, why should you be the one to actually solve this problem? So in the start of the video, there's a helpful little idea where in order to think about your career or building a startup or building a product, you need three puzzle pieces to fit together. So one of those are you need to have the right assets. In other words, you need to know the right things, you need to have the right skills, you might have to have the right people, you might have to have access to money or investors. You also need to consider market realities. That's kind of the why now question that I just talked about. And then the third one is aspiration. And aspirations tend to be ignored by a lot of people. They think, ah, I found a business opportunity. Let's go with it. This is what I want to do. This is going to be great. But here's the thing. If you look at the statistics, the average amount of time from when somebody founds a company until it has a successful exit, if it has a successful exit, most companies don't. Um, and by exit, I mean something like an IPO or an acquisition. The average time is eight years. And of course, it's really an exit for the investors, which means the founders, the employees, they're probably going to stick on for a couple more years, at least after that. So if you're thinking of a large project like starting a company or some really complicated product, it's going to take 10 years. That's how to think about it, 10 years. And this applies not just to startups, this applies to complicated software. Uh, if any of your programmers in the room and you're thinking about creating a new database, that's a 10-year project, at least. Uh, you're thinking about creating an operating system, that's a 10-year project. That's just how long it takes a human being to do something large and complicated. And so the question you have to ask yourself when you come up with ideas like this is, are you willing to dedicate a decade of your life to doing it? If you're 25 now, you'll be doing it until you're 35. If you're 35 now, you'll be doing it until you're 45, if you're successful, and probably you won't be. So really think about why you should be solved, and really think about what problems you care about. There, I, I had a whole bunch of startup ideas before I started Atomic Squirrel, and when I looked at that list, I realized that I couldn't work on most of those for 10 years. I just couldn't see myself working for a decade on these silly ideas that had nothing to do with anything that I actually cared about. So think about why you. So let's say you found a problem, and you're pretty sure you can do it. It's a good problem. It's the real problem. The next thing to think about is the size of the and the question you want to ask is, how many customers are you going to need for this to be a successful, viable business? And this matters, right? The, the number of customers and how much money you can make determines how much money you can raise now, how many people, uh, what your marketing strategy is going to be, what your sales strategy is. So this is a pretty pivotal, pivotal decision. One way to look at it, just kind of a helpful mechanic, is imagine you want to do a billion dollars in revenue per year. Huge, ridiculous number, but just helpful to get the imagination going. So there's a bunch of ways you can do a billion dollars of revenue. Hopefully you guys can do that from the back of the room. So for example, if your product costs one dollar and you want to make a billion dollars, 
you need a billion people or a billion sales. And that's going to be something like Coca-Cola with cans of soda. If your product costs $10, you need to find 100 million customers. And that's something that jumps in and jumps in. And so on all the way up the list until you get to something like Countrywide where their product costs a million dollars, and so they just need about 1,000 customers to be successful. Now, why does this matter? Well, one, uh, you want to, um, for basically by looking at this, you can figure out what marketing and sales strategy works, right? Coca-Cola needs to reach on the order of a billion people. So the only thing that can reach that many people is going to be mass advertising. That's why you see Coca-Cola all over the place. Whereas something like Oracle or Countrywide, they only need to reach a few thousand folks. So mass advertising is probably not the best way to target them. So they're going to assemble a really big sales team to do it. So A, this tells you how you're going to distribute your product. But the second thing that's really important about this is you have to find out that there's actually that many customers in the world, right? If you need a billion customers, you better sure that that's actually the market you can reach. And so here's a few tools that can help you answer that question. Um, there's obviously many others, but these are kind of my go-tos for a really, really quick sanity check on pretty much any of you. So the first one is to look at your competitors. Now a lot of people, when they come up with an idea, they'll Google around and they'll find competitors and they'll say, oh no, there's somebody doing this already, I should give up. Competitors aren't bad. They can, but they're not always. Uh, in a sense, the fact that there's somebody else building this is a good thing. It means it's a real problem. It means there's probably a real market. Um, and so there's a bunch of tools you can, see, you can use to see how your competitors are doing. Uh, for example, you can use web analytics tools to see how much traffic they're getting on the web. There's mobile analytics tools to see how many app downloads they have. There are social analytics tools to see how they're doing on Facebook and Twitter and Google search ranking. And you can look at their funding. Who's investing in them? Who's working for them? How are they getting money for this idea? So if there's some competitors, then the next thing you might want to do is to use some ad targeting tools. And I'm actually surprised at how few people seem to be aware of these tools. Uh, you don't have to actually buy the ad to use these tools. You can just use a whole bunch of ad targeting tools, and they have amazing ability to slice and dice their network by all sorts of demographics. And you don't have to pay for it. I mean, you can, and it's actually a really good way to validate the size of the market, just buy some ads and see who clicks. But just for free, you can go on. This is in the background. Uh, probably can't read it from where you are. Um, uh, this is from Google's Keyword Planner. And it allows you to type in keywords that you're thinking about, and it tells you how many people are searching for them. It also tells you similar keywords. So when I was building the, the Hello Startup website, I entered startup ideas into the search box. And something that Google Keywords Planner told me is, well, OK, this many people search for it, pretty large number. But way more people search for the term business which is important to know. So some of the tools out here that are all really easy and really quick to use are Google's Keyword Planner, Facebook ads, where you can slice and dice by what people like, where they are in the world, what interests they have. Uh, LinkedIn ads, where you can search by where they work, what kind of education they have, what kind of groups they're in. Twitter ads, based on what they're tweeting about. And all of these tell you approximately how many people match that criteria. And so you can very quickly find out if there's a billion people that like that concept or a thousand. And that's a pretty important decision before you go build the product. Um, another really, really important place to look is uh, to find a community for whatever you're building. Uh, probably anything you're thinking of, there is a community of people who are doing it already. And these folks will be, uh, when you get out of the building to talk to customers, this is who you want to go after. And there's a bunch of ways to find communities. These are the most generic ones where you'll find most communities. Uh, so meetup.com has millions of meetups around the world, lanyard lists conferences around the world. There's a subreddit for every weird interest you can possibly think of. There's core topics and questions on everything, LinkedIn groups on just about everything. Uh, but don't stop at these. I mean, these are really the starting point to see you know, how many people are in the subreddit for this concept. But what you'll find is that there's dedicated communities uh, that have a very different place. They don't always use these tools. So for example, I was working with a company that did board games, and we found out that the entire board game community is on one gigantic forum. And if you're not on there, your board game will not be successful no matter what you do. And if you get on there, all of a sudden you start selling games like crazy. So for whatever idea you're thinking about, you need to go and find the community, talk to them, find customers there, see how many of them there are. 
And then finally, just the good old cash research. research. Uh, there's no real magic here. Go read newspapers, go find relevant books, journals, <coughs> government reports, SEC filings. Uh, Google Trends can be helpful to get some ideas. Uh, there's companies that will send out surveys on your behalf. There's companies that will do full-on market research on your behalf. Uh, depends on exactly what your needs are. So final piece is uh, you found something, the market seems to be big enough, the problem seems to be real. The question is how do you start building? And the answer to that is the minimal viable product, or MVP. Now this is one of the probably most misinterpreted terms that I've come across in a very long time. And I find it helpful not even to think of it as a thing you build, but as a process you follow. And I'll explain why in just a second. So, uh, Edmund Williams has this great quote where he talks about how when a plane is flying from California to Hawaii, the plane's never really pointed directly at Hawaii. It's always a little off to the left or a little off to the right, and they just keep course correcting, and eventually they end up in the right. And what he says is that startups are exactly the same way, except usually they start going in completely the direction. Um, but the key idea here is you are constantly a course for it. And so if you ask people kind of what they think of product development, a lot of people have this sort of naive view, right? You came up with an idea, you validated it, it looks great, and now all you need to do is just invest time, and you'll have a proof of concept, and that'll go well, and then you'll eventually have a mature, and stable, and successful product. But the reality looks a little more like this. You build your proof of concept, and it doesn't work. And you go back to the drawing board. And you come up with a new idea, and you put it out there, and it doesn't work. And you go back to the drawing board. You put it out there, and you just keep doing that over and over. You keep course correcting over and over again. And so most of your time is spent doing trial and error. And in a trial and error world, finding errors fastest is how you win. And this isn't unique to startups. This is true just about anything. If you're writing a book, most of your time is spent rewriting the book and editing and fixing things. If you're writing code, most of your time is spent rewriting that code and refactoring it and cleaning it up. And if you're building a startup or building a product, most of your time is spent rebuilding that product and rebuilding that startup. And this is why thinking of the MVP as a process is so important. It's because it's not this one-time thing that you do. It's a constant course correction that you have to do over and over and over again. And it really comes down to two questions. You're just going to ask them again and again. And the first one is, what's my riskiest assumption? And the second one is, what's the smallest experiment I can do to test that assumption? And that experiment doesn't have to be a product at all. It just has to test your assumptions. So some examples of ways you can do it. So one is a landing page, just a static landing page that asks people for their email address. A company called Buffer did this. They were thinking of building tools to manage your social uh, social media, but they didn't know if anyone was actually interested. So they put up a static landing, static landing page. They described the product. It had some links to their pricing models, and then if you click on the link, you would be taken to a page where you can give them your email address. And they'll let you know when they launch. And they found two things. One, a lot of people were interested in the idea. And even more importantly, they found that a lot of people were interested in paying money for the idea because they clicked the $5 or $20 link. And they did that at the cost of you know, a couple of days to put together a static landing page instead of building the whole product and finding out no one's interested in paying. Uh, another good idea is an explainer video. So before Drew Houston built Dropbox, he wanted to be sure that you know, his riskiest assumption was, does anybody actually want this thing? And building Dropbox, from a technology perspective, it's actually pretty complicated. You have to have all sorts of clients on all of your devices. You have to have a really fancy service. It takes a long time even to build a basic prototype. So he didn't want to spend all that time without knowing that people actually were interested in the product. So all he did instead was build a video. Just a simple video that clearly and with some good humor explained how Dropbox would work. And from that, he got hundreds of thousands of views. He posted it on Dig and Reddit and then knew pretty clearly that people were interested. So that's an MVP. Obviously, it's not the actual product. Um, there's another fantastic way to value your data here. It is crowdfunding. The folks at Pebble built a prototype of a watch. They didn't have an actual product in a factory ready to ship. They just had a prototype. And yet, people gave them $10 million before they had a real product. Right? This is what I mean about finding customers knocking down your door before you build a product. 
they raised ten million dollars off of you know kind of hacked together for OTIP. So crowdfunding is another fantastic way to validate your assumptions. Uh, Zappos. The founder of Zappos did not want to have a giant inventory of shoes because he had no idea if anyone would actually want to buy shoes online. So what he did is he put up a page that looked like a real online shoe store. But behind the scenes, he was actually going around to the local shoe store in his neighborhood, taking pictures of shoes by hand and posting them online. And when somebody ordered shoes, he would go back to the local shoe store, buy the shoes, and ship them by hand. And so this is called the Wizard of Oz MVP, right? There's somebody, there's a magical man behind the curtain. Perfectly valid way to test your assumptions without having to have a giant inventory of shoes in case nobody wanted to buy things online. And then Groupon did kind of this piecemeal MVP. So you build some parts of the product, and you kind of glue it and duct tape it together as best you can. So the original Groupon was some sort of simple WordPress template. They did the coupons by hand in FileMaker. They mailed the coupons out using just the Mac OS X mail app. There's just gluing technologies that happen to be out there as quickly as they can together without building the full ordering system, billing system, and all that. So, the smallest experiment doesn't have to be a product. And it certainly doesn't have to be anything close to a final product, but it does have to be viable. It does have to actually validate your assumptions. And the best way to illustrate that, uh, I'm not sure if you guys have seen this diagram, but the thing on top is a not viable MVP. The one on the bottom is a viable MVP. At every step of the way, whatever MVP process, whatever area of thing you're doing, uh, you need to make sure that the customer will actually use it. Because if they don't, then you can't actually answer the question of you know, do they want it. Okay. And if you guys want to see an example, this this blog post on the macro that I wrote uh, goes through a really detailed example of how to use MVP as a process as opposed to a single product that you build. Um, check that out. It goes into pretty good details. Okay, so that's basically the talk. Um, if you want to see more info, check out the book. If you want a free copy of the book, tweet out the book website with the hashtag startups. So it's hello guys startup on that. And whatever other text you want. And I'll uh, check tomorrow and send a free copy of that. And uh, all of those tools that I listed throughout the talk, all of the uh, ad targeting tools, all of the MVP tools, list of startup ideas, uh, you can find them on hellostartup.net slash resources. That's it, thank you guys.